evening, everyone. Welcome to the final of four faculty award lectures. Uh, during our centennial year, we made the determination that we'd like to have four faculty members speaking to the core themes of the institution. And uh, so tonight is the fourth in that series. The first one was Dr. Kevin Timpey, who presented on the theme of transformation. Dr. Peter Crabb, who I think is here tonight. I didn't see Kevin. Kevin's in San He's out of town. But Pete Crabb, we have everyone there, yes. And uh, service by Dr. Joe Gorman, Joe's over there. And then finally tonight, community uh, with Dr. Julie Strait. And we've gathered tonight because we believe that uh, the life of the mind and the life of the spirit can be commingled, and commingled quite effectively. The NNU Faculty Award Lecture really provides the opportunity for our faculty members to speak into that idea in a forum uh, like this one. While NNU still is primarily a teaching institution, uh, our mission statement encourages and prizes faculty scholarship. All of our university faculty really have a critical role in contributing to the sum of human understanding. The faculty at Christian universities, like NNU, have a particularly important role in that regard. As Christian academics, it is our role, role to join the academic critique join the academy and critique the patterns of scholarship, behavior, discovery, and art in the world around us. And if we've done that job well, not only will our scholarly activity achieve some measure of acclaim, we will also be able to implicate the dialogue, the motivational ethic that is expressly Christian. Tonight, we have an opportunity to see one of those wonderful minds at work. Uh, this award series lecture was the series, the selection process was chaired by Dr. Donna Allen, who happens to be here today. And thank you, Donna, for helping us to select these four wonderful lectures. Uh, tonight, though, uh, our centennial faculty lecturer is Dr. Julie Strait. Uh, Dr. Strait is an associate professor of English here at the University in the College of Arts and Sciences. She received her bachelor's degree in English literature from Wheaton College, her master's degree and PhD also in English literature. University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Tonight, Dr. Strait will be speaking on the value community as she presents her talk, Who is My Neighbor? Reflections from Literature on Circles of Community and Service. Please welcome Dr. Strait. Good evening. Thank you so much. I'm really grateful that each of you are here. And I especially want to thank my parents for coming here from the Seattle area and my husband's parents for coming here from the Phoenix area, and for the Faculty Development Committee under the leadership of Donna Allen um, for inviting me to give this talk tonight. I'm really glad I get to be here. Who is my neighbor? You might recognize the question from Luke 10. A scholar of the law asks Jesus, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus. Ever the teacher does not answer him, he asks the scholar, what does the book say? The scholar responds, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Right answer. But the scholar isn't satisfied, of course. He says, and who is my neighbor? Jesus still does not answer the scholar directly. He tells a story the story of the Good Samaritan. And that's what we do in my department on campus. We tell stories. We listen to stories. A straight theological statement is a fine thing. You can memorize it. You can recite it. But a story is tricky. It gets into your imagination and sets up housekeeping. It can make you laugh at other people's stupidity and then realize you're laughing at yourself. It can annoy you so you keep thinking and thinking and thinking about it. It can show you a world different from the one in front of you, a world that might be closer to the kingdom of God, and help you imagine how to get there. And to paraphrase Philip Sidney, stories don't just show you what you ought to do the way straight information might. They make you want to do what is right. So tonight, I'll tell you some stories. Stories, some are British, some are American, some are fiction, some are non-fiction, stories people have told with their lives as well as with their words. And tonight, all my stories will be at least a century year old, just like our university. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So we'll spend some time looking some slowly at some quotations to make sure we get the good stuff they have to offer us. Each of these stories will help us to consider the scholar's question, who is my neighbor? Perhaps together, these stories can help spark a vision of the kingdom of God that can guide us as we seek to obey these great commandments ourselves. Who is my neighbor? Considering the scholar's previous question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Maybe he's saying this, who do I have to love to inherit eternal life? Or if we're going to be grammatical about it, whom must I love to inherit eternal life? Any of you can sum up the answer, of course. Everyone. Religious differences, racial differences, even outright quarrels don't get us off the hook. Jesus commands us to love even our enemies. We also don't get to cut anyone else out just because we don't know them personally. The Samaritan helps a random person on the road, exemplifying the Old Testament command to love your, the stranger as yourself. And obviously, we need to love those immediately around us, too, in the usual sense of neighbor. God loves everyone and gives to all alike. And God calls us to be like him, perfectly complete in our love. Love everyone. But how can we love so many different people? This evening I'll explore the possible tensions between our different circles of community. Loving family and loving neighbors. Loving those nearby and those far away. I'll especially focus on the expression of love in two dimensions, time and money. The Good Samaritan gives both, and so must we. First I'll tell some stories that say we must care for our immediate community not neglecting it in favor of far-off concerns. Then I'll turn to writers that show how loyalty to our own family or church or nation can blind us to the needs and rights of other communities. We have to love our more distant neighbors, too. After we acknowledge our obligations to neighbors near and far, I'll try to consider some way of living faithfully in the tensions between these responsibilities. First, we must not love people far away and neglect the people right next to us. Charles Dickens calls this telescopic philanthropy. Do only good to people so far away, you need a telescope to see them. In his novel Bleak House, the narrator, Esther Summerson, goes to visit a woman named Mrs. Jellybee. On her way into the house, Esther rescues one of Mrs. Jellybee's dirty children, who's gotten his head stuck between the metal railings outside. Inside, Esther finds crumbs, dust, and waste paper all over. And when dinner is served, the meat is almost raw. The lady of the house, Mrs. Jellybee, is engrossed in papers and letters in a project to educate the poor natives of Oria Bulaga, which is vaguely located on the west bank of Niger. Her eyes, Esther tells us, have oops, a curious habit of seeming to look a long way off as if they could see nothing nearer than Africa. Dickens is rarely subtle, and Esther spells out the moral for us. Perhaps it is right to begin with the obligations of home. Perhaps, while these are overlooked and neglected, no other duties can possibly be substituted for them. It turns out Mrs. Jellybee com project comes to nothing anyway. Put down your telescope and love your family, not just people you'll never meet. So Dickens coined the term, you can find telescopic philanthropy in earlier British writings, too. Around the turn of the 19th century, the evangelical writer Hannah Moore wrote a series of cheap repository tracts to show her vision of what a Christian society should and should not look like. One of these tracts was Mr. Phantom, the new-fashioned philosopher. Mr. Phantom says, my labors for the public good leave me little time to think of my own family. I must have a great field. I like to do good to hundreds at once. But he won't give his own servants time to pursue any education, and his mind is too full of the sufferings of Poland and South America to have space for the petty sorrows and injustices in his own town. Hannah Moore lays on the irony when a cottage catches fire in clear view of Mr. Phantom's window. Everyone, even his children, run to help. But she comments that, the present distress was neither grand enough nor far enough for home 
to satisfy the wide stretched benevolence of the philosopher, who sat down within sight of the flames to work at a new pamphlet, which now swallowed up his whole soul on universal benevolence. His benevolence reaches to the whole world, but not next door. Both Dickens and Moore make clear that their telescopic philanthropists actually do no good to anybody, near or far. Their self-important thinking and writing are an excuse not to take any real action or exercise any real love at all. Colleagues, they might be making fun of us. But even love we show more concretely, with hard cash, is not enough if we only focus far away. As Eleanor Porter shows us in her book, Pollyanna. Now, don't you roll your eyes at me just because I'm bringing up Pollyanna, because I bet most of you have never read it. The movie does not count. <laughs> Pollyanna was first published as a book in 1913, the same year our university was founded, and the title character is not just an empty-headed optimist, as you might think from the way her name gets used today. She just always tries to find something to be glad about. She's also very practical in trying to give others reasons to be glad, too. Others like Jimmy, an orphan boy who wants a real home with real parents. No problem, Pollyanna thinks. She goes to the church ladies' aid meeting and asks if somebody can take Jimmy in. But oddly, nobody thinks she can. One woman proposes they could at least take some of the money they send to India missions and contribute that toward his education and support. But the others won't hear of that. Their church has always headed the list in getting to India, and they'd be mortified if they gave any less. Pollyanna leaves in considerable confusion. For the ladies' aide had decided he would rather send all their money to bring up the little India boys than to save enough to bring up one little boy in their own town, for which they would not get a bit of credit in the report. Pollyanna reflects, they act as if little boys here weren't of any account, only little boys way off. So Pollyanna gets a bright idea. She'll write to her church back home out west. Maybe Jimmy will be far enough away from them <laughs> to count as their little India boy. <laughs> Pollyanna's author, Eleanor Porter, is mocking a different kind of telescopic philanthropy here. Philanthropy that gets, gives real money, not just words, but still keeps a safe distance. Charles Dickens, Hannah Moore, and Eleanor Porter are making fun of a real problem. And I think there's a bit of Mr. Phantom or Mrs. Jellybee in each of us. We want to think big and help hundreds at once. We're happy to send money far away. But don't ask us to bother with our own homes, the neighbor next door, the orphan boy in town. That's a pain and nobody will notice. But the small and the ordinary matter. That's a main point in the work of George Eliot, especially in Adam Bede. Her clergyman character, Mr. Irwine, takes care of three little country churches, but he's not too busy to play chess with his elderly mother, or daily to go and visit his invalid sister, even when she's not well enough to talk. Elliot lovingly describes how softly he enters his sister's room, takes her hand, and kisses it. A slight pressure from the small fingers told him it was worthwhile to have come upstairs for the sake of doing that. He lingered a moment, looking at her, and then turned away and left the room, treading very gently. He had taken off his boots and put on slippers before he came upstairs. Whoever remembers how many things he has declined to do, even for himself, rather than have the trouble of putting on or taking off his boots, will not think this last detail insignificant. A little thing to take off his boots in consideration for his sister. A little thing to kiss her hand and be with her for a minute in her pain. A little tedious, ordinary, enormous thing. A little moment, we might say, from the kingdom of God. On the other hand, we knew there was another hand. Remember that Jesus does not allow us to cut anyone out of our definition of neighbor. Of course our neighbors include our families and our next door Neighbors. So we laugh with Dickens, or Moore, or Porter, at the people who don't get that. Even if perhaps our own children or spouses get the short end of the stick occasionally. But loving the people who are handy is not enough by itself either. Remember those other biblical commands. 
You shall love the stranger as yourself. Love your enemies. Love for our own family and friends is not enough, even combined with sincere devotion to God. When I teach the early American literature survey, one of the saddest passages we read is from this 17th century work, from 1682. In this passage, a Puritan woman describes her community strategy for dealing with the Native Americans. It was thought if their corn were cut down, they would starve and die with hunger, and all their corn that could be found was destroyed, and they driven from that little they had in store into the woods in the midst of winter. And yet, how to admiration did the Lord conserve them for his holy ends, and the destruction of many still among the English? Notice the passive voice, as we would in the writing class, the grammar which avoids taking responsibility. Who thought? Who made this plan? Who cut down the corn? Maybe Rawlinson just kind of doesn't want to be too clear here, but let's just be direct. Her Puritan community thought that if they cut down the Indians' corn, the Indians would die of hunger. So they did destroy all the Indians' crops they could find, and even chase the Indians away from the food they had in store, into the woods in the winter. As Rawlinson reports with some astonishment, the settlers did not succeed in these systematic attempts to kill their neighbors. Instead, God kept them alive. But as scholars tell us today, the Indians' near starvation did contribute to their decision to attack the settlers in the war which occasioned Rowlandson's writing, the war in which she was taken captive for 11 weeks and lost many friends and family members, including a six-year-old daughter who died in her arms. Rowlandson firmly believes that God allowed these disasters to fall on her people as punishment for sin. The Lord has kept the Indians alive, not because he loves the Indians, but in order to punish his own people, who are, of course, the English. Oops. Our perverse and evil carriages in the sight of the Lord have so offended him that instead of turning his hand against them, the Lord feeds and nourishes them up to be a scourge to the whole land. Yet Rowlandson never seems to think that attempted genocide might be the particular sin involved. And you guys, Mary Rollins is no monster. You read her and you cannot help but be impressed by how devout she is, how courageous she is, how much she loves her own community. She just shares her community's blind spot, her failure to recognize other communities as their neighbors. In reading her, we realize it's not enough to just love our own people. We must also love others, starting by not trying to deliberately kill them. Rowlandson reminds us of a side of neighborly love that we might forget because it's just so obvious. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. My title tonight promises to discuss love as expressed in service, but we might do well to start here. Love does no harm. Not to your neighbor, not to the stranger, not even to your enemy. We might think we're above and beyond this command. We're out to do good, not to just avoid doing harm. But abstaining from harm is not necessarily so easy. What if your whole nation is wronging another nation or people? It commits its crimes with the help of your tax dollar and your allegiance. Arguably, you, as part of your nation, are doing harm to your neighbor, and you need to stop. Henry David Thoreau makes this point in his work, Resistance to Civil Government, better known as Civil Disobedience. In 1846, the United States declared war on Mexico, a war of blatant invasion and conquest. This was not a case like Rollinson's where people didn't realize they were doing wrong. American citizens widely denounced the war, especially in the North. They considered it a wrong to Mexico, in an attempt to spread slavery, too. Both stop there. I complain. That's enough. But not Thoreau. He said, Those who, while they disapprove of the character and measures of a government, yield to it their allegiance and support, are undoubtedly its most conscientious supporters, and so frequently the most serious obstacles to reform. In other words, the people who get most in the way of doing justice 
are not the people directly doing the wrong, say the soldiers fighting in Mexico, but those back home who believe it's wrong but keep supporting the government anyway. Similarly, Thoreau noted that slavery was not perpetrated by the South alone, but by the Northerners who tolerated it because it served their own financial ends. He said, practically speaking, the opponents to a reform are not 100,000 politicians in the South, but 100,000 merchants and farmers here who are more interested in commerce and agriculture than they are in humanity and are not prepared to do justice to the slave and to Mexico, cost what it may. In other words, he says neither the war nor slavery could continue without the help of those who officially oppose both but meanwhile are making too much money from both to do anything quite effective to stop them. Thoreau's answer? He does not think that every person has a responsibility to try to set right of every wrong, however bad it is. A person may have other concerns, other responsibilities, but each should, each should at least not contribute to it. He says, if I don't devote myself to ending the wrong, if I devote myself to other pursuits and contemplations, I must first see at least that I do not pursue them sitting upon another man's shoulders. I must get off him first that he may pursue his contemplations too. That's quite a picture, isn't it? I have my own life to live, but I'm not free to live it on someone else's back. First I must get off the other guy, then go about my life and let him go about his. Thoreau didn't just talk. He took steps to live out what he said. He refused to pay the tax that he saw supporting wrongdoing and went to jail for one famous night as a result. He said about the injustice in the government that if it is of such a nature that it requires you to be an agent of injustice to another, then I say break the law. Let your life be a counter friction to stop the machine. What I have to do is to see at any rate that I do not lend myself to the wrong I condemn. You don't necessarily have to stop every injustice, but if it sucks you in so you're committing injustice yourself, it's time to resist. Even a big machine can get jammed. Throw your life into jamming. Love does no wrong to its neighbor. Don't pay even a dollar to do wrong. Once in an airport, a woman asked me what I was reading. Bro, I said, well, that's dangerous, she said. And she's right, it should be. But in fact, it usually isn't. I teach him every year, and a revolution has not started yet. <laughs> I admire Thoreau. This essay on resistance to civil government has helped transform the world by influencing Gandhi, by influencing Martin Luther King Jr., and others. But although Thoreau's words stir me, they don't change my behavior very much. I often believe our government is doing wrong, but I still pay my taxes. I might write a letter to my senator or representative, which would completely not impress the row, but I'm still contributing to the law. <laughs> so what do we do when we find ourselves entangled in wronging our neighbors? What if even our own godly Christian community is perpetrating wrong and expects us to help? The row has an important prophetic voice, but I think we might find more help in another, earlier American writer. Take yourself now, imagine yourself in Mount Holly, in western New Jersey, in 1742. This is 60 years after Rowlandson published her Indian captivity narrative, and about 100 years before Thoreau's civil disobedience. A man who owns a Negro woman is selling her to an elderly member of his church, and he orders his employee to do the paperwork. A young employee named John Woolman what goes through a woman's mind. He writes, The thing was sudden, and though the thoughts of writing an instrument of slavery for one of my fellow creatures felt uneasy, yet I remembered I was hired by the year. It was my master who directed me to do it, and it was a member of our society who bought her, so through weakness I gave way and wrote it. Yet, he says, I was so afflicted in my mind that I said before my master and the friend that I believe slave keeping to be inconsistent with the Christian religion. 
This is a passage from the Journal of John Woolman, a book I had never heard of until I took a graduate class in early American literature, but it's one that deserves more attention. I love Woolman, partly because in his journal we see him struggle, which makes him a more accessible model to us than, say, Thoreau. His Christian community, the Society of Friends, which you might know as the Quakers, did much better with the Indians than Rollins' community had, yet they still had this blind spot. They kept slaves. Woolman was sure this was wrong. He recognized complexities in the situation, just as we academics would want him to. Some slaveholders really cared for their slaves' good. Many people in the Caribbean would probably go hungry if slavery were suddenly abolished, and so forth. Economics then, as now, were complicated. Still, slavery was wrong. And Woolman grieved over the evils he saw firsthand in his travels, such as disregard for slaves' marriages, the nakedness they suffered, their severe punishments, and their lack of education, particularly Christian education. He also grieved for their owners, their Christian owners, who would deprive their fellow creatures of the sweetness of freedom, as he puts it, for the sake of mere earthly riches for themselves and for their children. He sees slavery as entangling and burdening the slave owners. These are the words he uses. Keeping them from living the truth of the gospel. Woolman wanted a life or practice to harmonize with principle. A life in which what he does matches with what he knows to be true. He firmly believed in the universal love of God for all people. And holding slaves or supporting slavery in any way opposed that love. So what to do? Struggle. The journal shows a repeated pattern as you follow it through the decades. Woolman is troubled by a wrong. He prays about it with sorrow, but also with confidence that his good shepherd will lead him. And then he follows whatever leading he receives, whatever the cost to himself. As you read the journal over the decades, you see his life change. As a young man, he wrote that bill of sale for a slave, but not again. Later, he refused profitable business in writing wills for people who were going to leave their slaves to their children, unless they changed those wills to set the slaves free, as at least some of them did. As a young man, he was a storekeeper, and he sold products of slave labor, like sugar and molasses. But by the end of his life, he had gone several years without even tasting as a young man, here's a really sticky one, he had stayed with slaveholding Quaker families when he took trips to preach. It was a standard thing for you know, someone to put, put up the guest preacher when you came to town. And this made him really uneasy, because when he stayed with a slaveholder, he was benefiting from slave labor, even while he was going on this trip, often to talk against slavery. So this was a pretty significant compromise. And when you're reading along in his journal, that comes up, and then 11 years later in his journal, 11 years, it's still on his mind. And this time he writes saying that after long, tearful prayer, he's decided to keep staying with those families, but to give their, their money to pay the slaves for the work that they've done. This was an awkward thing to do with wealthy hosts. Can you imagine? A trial both to me and them, he says. <laughs> but he did it anyway. Woolman didn't just rest in wrong practices, even if it took him years to find a way out of those practices. He diligently sought to follow the truth through long, perplexed prayer, loss of income, socially awkward situations, and even eating and drinking without sugar. A key part of Woolman's living against slavery was speaking against slavery. He loved slaves and slaveholders much too much to keep silent. But unlike many activists, he diligently tried to follow the truth in the way he spoke, as well as in what he spoke. Sometimes, this meant keeping silence, even when the slaves were most on his mind. Such as one meeting in which he says, I found no engagement to speak concerning them, the slaves, and therefore kept silence, finding by experience that to keep pace with the gentle motions of truth and never move but as that opens the way is necessary for the true servants of Christ. The truth is gentle, 
he would wait for the truth to open the way. And then when he spoke, even to slaveholders, he was friendly. He spoke with goodwill. He labored with them in love, as he put it. This is so different from our culture today, isn't it? If you really feel passionately about something, you have to go say it. You have to say it as strongly as possible and as offensively as possible. Mm -hmm. And woman just is such a counterexample to that. So let me show you an example of how he spoke, because you can't really get it unless you see it. Later in a woman's life, he was considering a trip to the West Indies, the Caribbean. I'm imagining it was probably part of his anti-slavery work. But the ship that would have taken him there also shipped slaves. He himself would be benefiting from the slave trade. Passage is cheap on a slave ship. And he would be implicitly condoning the slave trade by his presence. After days of praying with a troubled mind, he decided not to go. And he explained why to one of the ship owners, who was a fellow Quaker. He acknowledges to the man that very few people, even godly people, boycott slave produce. He says, the number of those who decline the use of the West India produce on account of the hard usage of the slaves who raise it appears small, even among people truly pious. But, he goes on to say, when good people buy slave produce and seek profit through the slave trade, it makes the oppressors more comfortable about their wrongdoing. And he says, that complaint of the Lord by his prophet, they have strengthened the hands of the wicked, hath very often revived in my mind. Woolman suggests that if he rode on the ship, he would be strengthening the hands of the wicked by easing the consciences of the slave traders, making them feel okay about what they're doing. Here's the best part. He goes on to say, I do not censure my brethren in these things, but believe the Father of mercies, to whom all mankind by creation are equally related, hath heard the groans of these oppressed people, and is preparing some to have a tender feeling of their condition. Look how gentle he is. He says, I'm not condemning my brothers. He's not even condemning the ship owner he's writing to, who's another Quaker. And he reminds the owner who God is, the Father of mercies who created every human being. God hears the groans of the oppressed, and now he's preparing his people to feel for the oppressed, too. Woolman goes on to say, And the trading in, or frequent use of, any produce known to be raised under such lamentable oppression hath appeared to be a subject which may yet require the serious consideration of the humble followers of Christ, the Prince of Peace. He points out a contradiction. On the one hand, we have produce that results from lamentable oppression, the mistreatment of people whom our God has created. Notice again the grammar here. Woman doesn't accuse anyone by saying who trades or who uses this produce, just that trade and use are happening here. On the other hand, we have this quest to humbly follow the Prince of Peace. You know, we really need to think seriously about this. Woolman is much less individualistic than Thoreau. He's not just about keeping his own hands clean. Instead, he shows real love for others. Love that won't rest while people are suffering from sin, either as oppressed or as oppressors. He loves his own community enough to hold it accountable. Friends don't let friends enslave people. He also loves the slaves enough to want them free, which can only happen when the whole community comes to consensus and decides neither to hold slaves nor to support those who do. Only his whole community can effectively free the oppressed, and only by freeing the oppressed will his community itself become free. Woman's love for his neighbors and consistent action and gentle words made a difference. He died in 1772. Only four years later, in 1776, the Society of Friends prohibited slavery completely among all its members, long before most Christians did, and way long before the new nation as a whole became free of slavery. Through woman's witness, his community came one step closer to what we might call the kingdom of God. I said earlier that there's a little Mrs. Jellybee, a little Mr. Phantom in each of us. Let me love someone conveniently distant, 
don't bother me with people right here. But I think there's also a bit of Mary Rowlandson or Thoreau's Northern businessmen in each of us. I'll take care of my family, but it's not my job to worry about those other people who are far away, those people who are not like me. Let me give you one example that's weighed heavily on me. On April 24th of this year, 1,127 workers, mostly women, were killed in Bangladesh when their workplace collapsed on them, a clothing factory. The day before, they could see cracks in the walls. An inspection had called the building unsafe. But the owners said they had to go to work anyway or lose their jobs. These are our neighbors. They are oppressed. Bangladesh is the second biggest exporter of clothing in the world, largely because the lack of safety and wage regulations makes Bangladeshi clothing prices very low. These workers earned less than 25 cents an hour. And in the months after the collapse, what did I find around my house? And one of these is from something I was actually wearing when I first drafted this paragraph I discovered afterwards. I think I have some serious considering to do here. So now what? Let's go back to our passage from Luke. Luke tells us that the scholar of the law asked, who is my neighbor, because, remember, he wanted to justify himself. Poor guy. That's a lost cause. We're never going to justify ourselves with adequate love for our neighbors. These stories I've told tonight might remind us of neighbors that we've forgotten, but they're not going to justify us. Story, stories usually do not. But they might help guide us with a vision of the kingdom of God, as our school statement says. I think woman helps us most, so I'll end with a few points I've gathered from reading him. First, we might evaluate our individual service to each community, in part by its effects on other communities. Woman says... Whoever rightly advocates the cause of some, thereby promotes the good of all. This means at least two things. On the bright side, right service to one community has good effects on the others. The examples are obvious. Teaching our students well serves the wider community to which they go. Serving the wider community makes it a better place for our students, our children. You know all this. But Woolman's words also caution us. Serving some promotes the good of all only when it is done rightly. In other words, if we care for some in ways that do not promote the good of all, that's not right service. Whoever went from Mary Rowlandson's community to destroy the Indian's corn probably intended good service to the Puritan community, but it was not right service, and it ended up hurting the Puritans too. If I go shopping and I buy the cheapest product available, I intend good service to my family by saving money. But if I'm saving money through another person's oppression, that's not right service. Of course, trying to serve justice overseas, but neglecting my family is not right service either. We need to evaluate each with our service to each community with an eye to its effect on the others. Second, we can see each of our communities not as an end in itself, but as a unit for serving other communities. A community that's only fully itself when it serves other communities. No one person can research the sources of all the clothes he or she wears, even in a week. But together, maybe a class or a club at a Christian university could research a few manufacturers, share with each other what they learn, and act on what they find. No one person who boycotts clothing from Bangladesh is going to make a difference. But together, as a part of a Christian church or university community, we start having a little clout as a market for goods that cost a little more, but are made by people in conditions a little more like the conditions we would want if we were in their place, conditions more in line with the kingdom of God. No one person can sustain a concern for using money justly when surrounded by people who think their money is their own to spend as they please. But together, 
as a church or a university, we can establish a different kind of normal. Maybe what Wesley might call a sanctifying context, a culture of seeking to use money in a way that serves the kingdom of God. No one person can meet the enormous needs of our world or even of our own town. But together, a Christian church or university can make a big difference. Not neglecting the needs overseas, Pollyanna's little India boys, but not neglecting the Jimmies, our own needy children at home either. One of the most loving things we can do for people in our churches, our families, our, our university, is to work with them to love people beyond the boundaries of those communities. I started this evening with one story Jesus told, the story of the Good Samaritan. Let me with, end with another story he told, and consider how a woman might help us place ourselves in that story. It's the story of the prodigal son, that younger son who squanders his inheritance in a far country before he comes to himself one day while he's feeding the pigs and returns to his father. Now, we might think that a good, earnest Christian like John Woolman would fit in the parable as the prodigal son's older brother, you know, the one who was at home with his father from start to finish. But I'm not sure that's where John Woolman himself would have placed himself. John Woolman had such a vision of God's universal love God's love for everyone, that when he looked at his own life, he said, I'm not there yet. We're not there yet. He saw the distance between the country where he and his faith community lived and the place where God's will is fully done, where everyone does to others as they would want done to them. The home of the Father, what we might call the kingdom of God. He saw the distance and let it grieve him over months and years. He prayed for his father's guidance and then followed it for those same months and years, one step at a time. We don't like to see that distance. We don't want to admit how far we are from our father's house, our father's kingdom of love for all. We consider ourselves the found, not the lost. So if we find ourselves feeling lost, sinning against love in a way we don't even know how to stop, Maybe in a messy family situation, or a whole economic system that can't just walk down the aisle and get saved in an evening. We panic. And we try to shut our eyes to the vision of the kingdom and pretend that really feeding the pigs is as close to home as we can get. But Roman shows us a better way. A way of love that looks without fear at the distance between the far country and the Father's house. Like him, we can pray. Like his community, our community can talk together about our failures in love and say, let's seriously consider this. Then we can wait for the gentle motions of truth to show us the way. In our family, in the global economy, and everywhere in between. As we seek the kingdom of God, the kingdom of love for all neighbors, we can rest in total confidence in the love of our Father. Our Father, whose angels start rejoicing, not when the sinner is fully transformed, but the first moment the sinner repents. Our father who runs down the road to meet his prodigal sons and daughters while they are still a long way off, and then walks with them every dusty step home. teach it for a few years and I just got back into it in the last couple. They like him and one of the things they like most, I don't do his journal in the class, I do the considerations on the keeping of Negroes. Addressed to professors of Christianity of every denomination, as it's called. It's a little tract he wrote about slavery in particular. And so we read this and one of the things that strikes the most is the difference in his rhetorical um, stance from the people who went before. So he'll say, my way is to entreat. You know, I, I have to share something that's been on my mind here. 
He's so understated and yet so clear. And they're really struck by that because we've been reading very, you know, didactic people who are very sure of themselves, like John Winthrop, or even someone like Cotton Mather, who's he shows some doubts as he's prosecuting, you know, doing the witchcraft trials, but still is pretty sure that we've got to do what we've got to do here. And sounds pretty, well, maybe a little defensive. Woolman doesn't. Woolman was able to say what he needed to say and then leave it. He didn't think it was his job to make things happen. He felt it was his job faithfully to speak when he was called on to speak. Yes, Chris. Yes. <laughs> He's the American history professor. Is there something about the communities that makes this different? Absolutely there is. I don't know if Woolman's methods would work here. Woolman is a Quaker. Their whole, and I, I don't know if Rob King or any of our Society of Friends people are here tonight, but the Quakers have this whole, they have meetings in which there is space. They'll be quiet unless someone feels the need to speak, from what I understand. And then there's room to speak about what's going on. And they believe in working by consensus. And I have had students who are society friends who've gone to these meetings and say, it's an amazing thing. Because they will keep talking until there is consensus. And in that kind of thing, you can't just silence a voice and get rid of it. And so the whole way the Quakers were set up, as opposed to the Puritans, you know, you know, we we read in my class John Winthrop, and then we read the trial of Anne Hutchinson, who dared to bring up some opposing point of view theologically and gets kicked off to Rhode Island for trouble. So, yeah, the Quakers had a very different way of dealing with things, and that's part of what, what made Woolman's uh, witness so effective. Century historian, you will correct as needed. Um, there's more. There does seem to be a little bit more tribal sort of thinking, more focused on the local community in different ways. The 18th century was especially the age where you got more philosophers who were talking about the need to love everybody. Jonathan Edwards, for example, in our country, um, and several over on the other side of the Atlantic. So it was a it was a big political. Thing for a while there in the 18th century. Should I just be focusing on loving my own next door neighbor? Hannah Moore was coming down on that side of the debate. Or do I also have an obligation to remember these other people? And then there were others who came down on that side. So I didn't put that together in a chronological progression, but as your time goes on, I think you do see more awareness of the wider picture that we need to keep touch of. And then the reaction against that, which is what Hannah Moore was really part of. Do you want to speak to this, Chris? Did you hear Chris okay? It's not that the Puritans are tribal, they just divide the world into the elect and the damned. <laughs> Which does simplify things a certain amount. Yeah, so you're, I mean, John Winthrop, the famous, you've probably all heard in political speeches, the City on the Hill um, sermon quoted, we shall be as a city on the hill, the eyes of the world are upon us. The less famous parts of that sermon, um, he talks about how we must do good to all, especially to those of the household of faith. He especially picks out that as his verse. So you especially have to focus in on loving your Christian community. And of course, when you've only got 200 people on the boat or 300 people on the boat, that's relatively, relatively simple. Yes, Compared to an economy of the 17th century, where you could pretty well track that all the sugar came from the West Indies. Right. How that worked. Right. This economy isn't like that. I know. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's why I focus on the woman. It was simpler then, but that doesn't mean it seemed simple to them. 
I mean, you know that around 1800, people said, well, you know, slavery is really a terrible thing, but it's just really too bad, there's nothing we can do about it. They believe that just as honestly as we believe there's nothing we can do. Were they wrong? They were wrong. Are we wrong? I think we're giving up too easily. And that's why I ended with where I ended. So we don't see the way. Well, let's start looking, you know? I, I just, we forget it's a seek first, the kingdom of God. We just want it to appear. You know, and when it appears, we're happy to jump on board. No, no, no. Seek the kingdom of God. It's okay if we don't see the way yet. But if we don't try, where is that going to take us? So, yeah, I mean, and woman, you guys, when you read his writing, he was, he was a sad person, but also very much at peace. I mean, he, he just kept following these things up and, and waiting and praying and praying and waiting and working. So he saw his infinite, tiny little steps that were moving in the right direction. And I think we need to do that too. There are things we can do as individuals, just as Woolman did. I mean, like it's really going to make a huge difference that he's paying a few silver coins to the slave owner to give to his slaves. But it did make the slave owners go, well, okay. And little by little, those ripple effects go out. I don't think that we can just say, well, there's nothing I can do, so let's just go back to watching some TV and bon bon, you know? <laughs> there are things that we can do, and it's our job to do them, even if they're small, and even if they're not glamorous, and even if they're not doing good stuff hundreds at once. Go on. Julian, in the current age where uh, there is so much written literature, I'm not going to call most of it literature, right. um, <laughs> but the ponderous of writing that's available, how would you see a writer Of 
Oh, sure. And, and um, I told him about Neil's essay on liberty, where he talks about the crowd and decides not to be the crowd and decides Jesus and how those weren't evil people, they were just normal people. So I tell my classes that, with our minor you know, but uh, I tell my classes the battle of all the kids between good and evil, between good and normal. Yeah. And I suspect that. And I'll say something self-righteous and have to apologize in the next class period and say, it's easy to call names, but what are people going to look back on us 200 years later and say, what were they thinking? I think, I mean, I mean, just off the top of my head, we need to think about how we use money. I mean, we need to read the Gospels again and think about how we're using money. And I think it would really, really help if we could form some little communities, little small groups, where we talk about money. When we talk about how we're using it, and we talk about, okay, I need a new pair of running shoes. Which which company is the least unethical? Least unethical, <laughs> you know? Um, and and try to at least, I mean, even if we do little things, but I don't think any of us can do it as an individual. I just I mean, it's too exhausting. You just can't. But I think that if we get together, and even you know, a couple households at a time, and say. Well, what's a, one step? There's this great quotation from Teresa of Avila that was in an earlier draft. A lot of things got tossed. Um, it says, Michael's laughing because he saw a lot of them. <laughs> uh, he, she says, often the devil will, let's see, how does it go? I should have just kept it in. The devil will tempt people with visions of great things that they can do so that they don't do the small possible things. Right in front of them. He tempts them with great impossible things so that they will not do the small possible things. But if we if we do things, the Lord will lead the way. The Lord's majesty will lead us in the way if we faithfully follow the small things. So I think not being afraid to do the small, almost meaningless thing and do it anyway with money and do it with other people. Because it's just so lonely if you don't. I agree with what you're saying, but I think there are some voices that can help us. Yes. For Talk example, about those. Well, for example, the book, and I'm horrible with making this, but the book Toxic Charity yeah. uh, talks about how poorly we uh, we our well meaning but very destructive ways of trying to help yes. can be, and then uh, gives some guidelines uh, of ways we can, we can be more effective. Right. And even our own little denominational uh, missionary book, uh, Chickens for Everyone, takes on this whole idea of what is the best way to help rather than sure. um, just throwing money or doing uh, what we hope will help, but really thinking through the issue and, and working it forward. Right. And again, we can't think it all through. 
visually. It's really exhausting. But that's part of why I ended up talking about Bangladesh instead of all the places we ought to be just sending money. I mean, what if you pay them decent wages in the first place? There's no problem with dignity there like there is with just charity. Jamie? In terms of what Donna asked, artists oftentimes have big voices in these social things. Yes. Someone who I just happen to think of is a photographer by the name of Edward Rutinsky, and he has made a video called Manufactured Land. And I have it if anybody wants to watch it. We've shown it to our students before. Um, but he is really great, kind of like um, the man that you were talking about, because he, through photographs and video, shows us what we've done with our landscapes and how it's really changed. He travels to China. He travels to um, tire, um, where tires go to die in, in California, the mile-deep um, quarry in Salt Lake City. But he does it in a way that is observational, and is mm -hmm. and they're really beautiful, actually. But it is mind-blowing. At the very beginning, it's a whole 20-minute segment of a, a factory in China where they're making iron. And it is endless. So it, it, it's really moving, and it just changes the way we think about buying something. Well, yeah, and our economy is predicated on the assumption that all you as a buyer need to know is the price. All you need to know is how many dollars it's going to cost you. But are you really making a fully informed and free decision if that's all the information you have and you don't see the human cost behind this thing that you can just pick up like this? You guys, I've been focusing over on those nice people, but are there questions on the side of the room? This is made Vietnam, so I'm okay. So it's <laughs> I'm not sure that makes it okay, but it is. That's my point. Yeah. Yeah, Kevin. About economics, but with a you know, hero of mine, especially with Fred Rogers. You want to think about somebody who really took a radical approach and saw, I mean, a brand new medium in television in its early days and said, I think I can make a difference. And he always wanted to be your neighbor. Yeah. You know, um, what a wonderful man. Yeah. I will get a, ask you a question. Okay. Um, how would you how would you uh, put the debate on uh, immigration reform in the context? Immigration reform? Yeah. Oh golly, man. I don't even let my students write papers on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if we're talking about slavery. Well, well kind of. Well, I, I have to say that passage about love the stranger as yourself. When you look at it in context in the Old Testament. You theologians know this. It's talking about people who come into the land of Israel from outside. And it says, you shall, you were, you know what it was to be an alien in Egypt, so you must love your neighbor as yourself. And I have a theologian friend who does this in a lot more depth, but yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah, I'm not qualified for it. But every product that's even made in the U.S., I mean, probably, uh, you know, uh, any food source that we have, uh, you stay in a hotel, uh, you know. Right, and when someone's an odd, undocumented worker, their employers can do anything they do and what they want. And, and Devin back there is the person, actually Devin's the person who should ask, do you want to comment on this, Devin? Because Devin has had a lot more involvement in this than I have. Um, I mean, I don't know if I can say much more than what you said, but yeah, I mean, there's, I've seen a lot of, uh, my church does some work with Helped by immigration to deport his students and families to be left here without them and um, their children. And so, yeah, it's definitely a difficult issue. Yeah. There's a march in Louisiana on the 6th. Just in case you wanted to know. There you go. <laughs> Do you really want to get me started? <laughs> With administrators present? <laughs> you have gender, don't you? I do. Okay. <laughs>
lot of things that we can do. I mean, I, I talked to the Andy Chaplin tonight about getting fair trade chocolate chips for the cookies. I don't know if you put up a sign to that effect, but he was so excited to work with me. And, you know, glad to do that. Even though none of our normal suppliers carry fair trade chocolate chips. And cho there's, a, there's a few products that are especially egregious. I've had a couple student papers now on slavery and the cocoa production. Until about after you've heard it enough times, you're like, oh crud, I guess I can't just forget about this anymore. <laughs> you know? So I think we could look at we could look at our food supply. We can look at your NMU sweatshirt, because it was a lot of college suppliers. There's a book called Overdressed, um, that's kind of the equivalent of Fast Food Nation for clothing, and it's not as well done for Fast Food Nation as well done. This one isn't very. But it talks about a place in Costa Rica. That it was a pressure from a lot of college communities for their local stuff that helped get this place going. They pay better wages, their workers are way better off than people at those places. So we can start by looking at that stuff. Um, we can consider how we include our own employees and, and people who work here, even if they're not our employees, in the chapel program. Um, that's, that's one thing that I was thinking more to try to do a little bit. Let's talk a that was quietly together, but since you just brought it up, it was a kind of small environment. I'll just bring that up too. I, I think there's a lot of things we can do. And like I, I mean, I'm also quite serious that we're a big enough community that if we decide we care about something, we've got a whole bunch of educated people. That would be most of you on this side of the room. We have a whole bunch of people that are young and have lots of energy. Should be a lot of you on that side of the room. <laughs> <laughs> What you're doing all sitting separately from each other, I really can't explain. <laughs> but you realize well, we've got resources here that are pretty amazing if we want to right, stop. I know, I know a lot of uh, Christian colleges and universities have, have, have really gone green. Yeah. Uh, a lot of college, Christian colleges and universities yeah. and other have yeah. like, started their own gardens yeah. and have, have done produce on campus. And That's right. Have, have done a and there's been some talk about doing that, I believe. Uh, things with, with recycling. Yes. Which, yeah, we're a little behind on recycling. Okay. Yeah. yeah there's, there's a lot of things we can do. I think it would be great to just form a whole bunch of small groups to pray and see what God brings up. I think that's what we're going to do. I've been doing WWJWD for a long time now. <laughs> <laughs> what would John Woolman do? For a lot of questions in my life. Yes? Uh, maybe a comment apropos to your concluding statements about who is the boss yeah. of the prodigal son. Maybe a note of encouragement. My experience has been that the more like Christ a person is, in my judgment, the greater is their awareness of the gap between the kingdom of their life and the kingdom of heaven, yeah. the kingdom of God. Yeah. And they're the ones that are saying, woe is me. There is I am undone. And there's so much more that can be done. Yes. So I celebrate this conversation yeah, I mean, as an example of seeking Christ. Yeah, I think we're called to a life of repentance. Not in a bad way, necessarily. It's hard to talk about it very clearly, I think. Let's thank Julie Check for you. Thank you. And a medallion for you to wear at graduation. <laughs> now you can be one of the medallion people. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you.